Good evening, everyone. My name is Jeff Thielman, a member of the Arlington School Committee and the chair of the Arlington High School Building Committee. Thank you for joining us tonight. This is a very exciting time for Arlington. As you see when you drive by the school on Mass Ave, in a little over two months, we anticipate opening parts of our new building. Tonight, Dr. Janger and the project team will give a preview of what to expect during the upcoming transition in February and March of 2022. Construction of phase one is nearing its end and, we'll, and we will soon open the first new wings of the school. Phase two will begin immediately and will entail demolition of parts of the old school and building the next phase of the new school. As you can imagine, there are quite a few logistics we wanna share with you tonight. We have allowed ample time for questions and answers at the end of our presentation tonight, so please submit your questions in the chat. In addition, the building committee has created a number of supporting materials for this transition, and you can find them now on our project website, www.ahsbuilding.org. Before I continue, I just wanna have everyone on our uh, screen introduce themselves. As I said, my name is Jeff Thielman and I chair the Arlington High School Building Committee. Laurie, you wanna go ahead? Or... Thanks, Jeff. My name is Laurie Coles and I am the architect with HMFH Architects. Thank you. John Lamar. Good evening, everyone. John Lamar, Consigli Construction Company. I'm the Senior Project Manager. Dr. Janger. You're muted, Dr. Janger. I'm still Matthew Janger, and I'm still the high school principal. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Janger. Dr. Holman. Hi, everyone. My name is Liz Holman. I am the Superintendent of Schools for Arlington. Jim Burroughs. Uh, Jim Burrow, Senior Project Manager with Skanska, and we're serving as the Owner's Project Manager. And uh, Mr. McCarthy. I'm Bill McCarthy. I'm the Assistant Principal at Arlington High School. Great, thank you. I think I got everybody. On behalf of the Building Committee, I want to give a brief update on the project. <clears throat> we began talking about a new high school in Arlington in 2014. We secured approval from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, better known as the MSBA, to conduct a feasibility study in 2015. And in December of 2016, five years ago, the town officially formed the AHL, AHS Building Committee. After a lot of deliberation, we decided to build a new school on the existing site. The total cost is $289 million, with about $86 million coming from the MSBA, from the state. The school is designed for 1,755 students and it can serve more than that if necessary. I am happy to report to the community this evening that the project is on time, slightly under budget and is scheduled to be completed in 2024 with the fields and site work done in the spring of 2025. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the town has many partners in this complex project. On the screen, you'll see the logos of the Massachusetts School Building Authority, Consigli, our, our, our contractor, Skanska, our owner's project manager, manager, and HMFH Architects, our design team. Next slide, please. So in this slide, you can see the site plan. As you can see, we are building a new school on the same site as the current school. And behind it, we are improving our fields with artificial turf so we can have longer seasons and more time for outdoor activities for all students. This slide shows you the connection to the bikeway, the location of the amphitheater, learning courtyard, preschool, and parking areas. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> on this slide, you see an overview of the various of the project phases. Um, as you can see, we are completing phase one construction in the front of the existing school. And um, we are, that's the STEAM and Performing Arts Wing. 
Um, <clears throat> phase two is the humanities wing, central spine, cafeteria, library, preschool, district offices. Phase three is the athletics wings. And phase four, uh, we finish uh, the new school. Next slide, please. As you can see in this slide, we are completing phase one construction in front of the existing school. That's the purple uh, area that you see. Um, and behind the purple area uh, is uh, of the phase one construction zone, you'll see the existing stru structure of the existing school, the structure of the current school as it is designed at this moment, or as it is operated at this moment. Next slide, please. In phase two, um, you see, you see in this slide phase two, con the construction zone for phase two. The yellow area shows the active school and the green area shows the phase two construction area. You learn more about this tonight. The next slide, please. As you can see, our plan is to move into the new buildings on February 28th, begin demolition of the old school in March, complete the auditorium in April, and complete phase three of construction by September of 2023. Pandemic related issues have forced a delayed opening of the auditorium. However, all spaces in the performing arts wing that are outside of the auditorium will be functional when the steam wing opens in February. Next slide, please. <clears throat> in the next few slides, we're going to show you visuals of the Mass Ave lobby, steam wing and performing arts wing. I'm now going to turn this over to our architect from HMFH, Lori Coles. Thank you, Jeff. You wanna advance one, please? So this is a view I'm sure many of you have seen from Massachusetts Avenue. It is the new uh, Mass Ave entrance for the school. To the right on this slide is the steam wing. To the left on this slide is the performing arts wing. And you are seeing the canopy, the entrance canopy for the school. And just beyond the wall of glass, you are seeing the discourse lab, um, which is a unique uh, space for the new building. Next slide. So now we're inside the lobby and we're looking back at that entrance can canopy back towards Massachusetts Avenue. And just above us, that curved space is actually the underside of that discourse lab. And again, to orient you on the right of this slide would be the entrance to the new auditorium. And what you're seeing here is the beginnings of the installation of the flooring, which is going to be a beautiful terrazzo. Um, and that has actually progressed since this slide and it's stunning. Looking forward for you all to see it. Next slide. So now we are in the discourse lab up on the one floor above Mass Ave. And the image on the right shows that we have tiered seating and it will be seating for 120 people. Um, but it will be a light filled space with the ability to turn dark uh, depending on the presentations. And you're also seeing the uh, in process installation of the ceiling in the space, which will be quite unique, both for its lighting and um, the acoustical properties um, of the different ceiling tiles that will go in here. Next slide. And this is a view of one of the 17 new science rooms that will uh, be in the upper three floors of the steam wing. You're seeing one side of the room uh, with the full wall of built-in cabinetry and storage. There's a second wall of that with sinks um, and they will be beautiful, um, highly functional science rooms for the future. Next slide. So in an effort to make corridors not feel like corridors, um, the corridors in the steam wing will be activated by a number of with a number of uh, treatments, one of which is the use of light wells. We have two different light wells. The image on the right is the larger one. We refer to it as the ellipse. It goes through the full height of this wing and will bring natural light down through all the windows to every floor. And similarly, we, we have a, a narrow sort of triangular light well 
that's on the left image, and that will do the same and bring light to all of the spaces. Next. So part of the activation of the corridors not only is to bring light uh, to all of these spaces, but also to provide different um, gathering or common areas within the corridor. And so this image on the right is showing that elliptical light well uh, with, with a counter all the way around it. And so it'll allow the students to sort of stop and gather, put down their laptop and so on. And the image to the left is showing again, sort of the view into the light well. And um, you may notice a theme of the cool colors in the light well, in the, excuse me, steam wing, where we have blues into lighter blues and um, darker blues. Next slide. And this is a view from the balcony level of the new auditorium, which will seat 826 people. And what you're looking at is the view back towards the stage uh, at the rear of this image. And uh, no, all of that scaffolding will go away. It's in fact already gone um, as of today, um, but it is under construction and um, looking wonderful. Next slide. And so in the performing arts wing, um, we've created sort of a, a hub zone for um, the students. And it's gonna double also as sort of a back of the house when, when performers, musicians and the like are waiting to uh, enter the stage for performance, but also a general hangout for the kids. So you're seeing in the image on the right, which is a rendering, um, a built-in bench and seating, and the colorful uh, image you're seeing on that wall is a, a full two-story height wall graphic that um, is has representative images of all of the performing arts. And the image on the left is showing this space under construction. So I am now going to turn this over to Dr. Matthew, Matthew Janger, the uh, principal of the high school. Unmute, Matthew. I think you got me one slide early, but that's okay. Um, so in phase two, um, which is, while we are in phase two, so we'll be in the steam wing and in part of the old building, what is going to be built next is the humanities wing, which will be the English history, um, English history, world language, um, and family and consumer science, as well as the guidance offices, the media center, the cafeteria. It will create that learning courtyard. The district offices and the preschool will be at the end of that space. So that will, that's what we built in the next year and a half after we make the move. Next slide. So in terms of just working through the details, um, and I have to give a, a massive shout out to Bill McCarthy, who has really been, I think, the, the, for our building end, the instructional move manager, managing a giant spreadsheet, both in his head and on paper, of where everyone's going to go next. So I'm going to give a high level um, description of some of the logistics of that. But I want to assure people there will be multiple opportunities when we will share this information out. There'll be another forum um, next month, which will be focusing more on details of this move. Um, and there will be advisories with students. Um, FAQ, which will be posted and shared with folks, as well as a quick guide with new maps of where things are. So we're going to try to put the information out in pieces so people can absorb it as we move forward through the phases. So the first step that's going to really start the move is happening right now. Um, right now, the um, Blue Gym is being converted to be a temporary cafeteria, um, and over break, Old Hall will be converted into a temporary library and we'll move those spaces. So we'll have an extended homeroom on the first day back in January, just so we can explain to students where they go and where things are going to be. Um, we'll have more seating actually in the blue gym in the pit than we currently do in the cafeteria. So we will be able to continue to spread students out during the winter months. Um, at February break, the plan is to have a half day on the last day before February break, which is February 18th, 
So students will be dismissed at 1130 in order to give teachers time for last minute planning. Although we have been meeting with them regularly and people are have been packing since this summer. Um, and then on the day back, February 28th, we'll have an 1130 delayed start, again, to give teachers an opportunity to come in, um, unpack and get ready for classes that afternoon. And we will give students an opportunity to come in um, in the hour before school, which we always do, um, and be prepared for them to have tours or to have people who can show them around as they are obviously gonna to wanna to go look around the building. Um, and then in April, the auditorium is slated to be completed. Next slide. So one of the things that's really been um, a major piece of this effort has been ongoing communication. We meet weekly with uh, the architect and design team. We meet weekly as part of the, um, the uh, with the construction team. And we're now, as we've been moving forward into more intensive interaction with the instructional space, we've been increasing those communications. So now the construction team is giving us weekly updates of project impacts and activities that might be happening near the instructional space. Um, and we're going to make every effort to really minimize that, that um, impact. Uh, John Lamar will talk more about this, but student areas, and construction areas have been separated by fencing and walls and will continue to be separated during the rest of the project. We will have most likely daily communications. We will map out both instructional activities that might impact, uh, I'm sorry, construction activities that might impact instruction, as well as instructional activities like testing or exams that um, would require us to not have uh, particular activities going on in order to work closely with the construction team. Um, that bullet actually I'll come back to later about passing time, but we are also aware that in the new building, both uh, that there's going to be some challenges in terms of flow. And you know, right now we will have a new four-story building. There will be one passageway into the next building, and then students will still be using Fusco House which is the oldest building, and Downs House, which is where the history department will still be over by the fields. Next slide. So a little recap there. So right now the library will move to Old Hall. Old Hall is the 100-year-old um, gym, actually, in the old building, but which we use as a study hall. The study hall in Old Hall will move to the pit. Um, the cafeteria will move into the blue gym, which will be a temporary space for them. Um, and then when we go, let's see, the primary, and so that, that's what's going to happen right when we come back. And then in February, the primary entrance now will shift because the horseshoe, the circle that we use in the back of the building will no longer be there. That'll be part of the construction zone. So in the back of the building on the Millbrook entrance, folks will be routed through those new parking lots. And in the front, which is where we would really like most student drop-off to take place, there'll be a drop-off zone along Massachusetts Avenue. Um, at that point, all of the science, technology, engineering, visual arts, mathematics, family and consumer science, and ELL classes, as well as a handful of other classes, will move into the new STEAM wing. Um, the steam wing starts on the second or third floor, depending on how you count, but it'll be a second floor in the new building. And then there are four stories above that. Um, so all the performing arts classes will be in the new band room, um, in the discourse lab initially, and then in the theater um, and in the co new chorus room, as well as in the new production studio. And then, as I said, in April, the auditorium is slated to be completed. Now, one issue that's come up recently, there's been a question which is sort of in discussion and being decided on right now, which is we moved initially the play for the spring, the spring musical, I'm sorry, to May to give us the possibility of being able to do the performance in the new auditorium. At this point, given the challenges of construction and the fine tuning of it, we are obtaining a new space so that we can do the performance there in a professional theater. Um, we, we, are, we are still hoping that it will be done in order for the seniors to be able to experience it and come into it, but we're planning to have the musical elsewhere. Next slide. 
So now I'm going to turn things over to John Lamar, um, who is the uh, Senior Project Manager for Consigli. Thank you. Good evening. Um, larger picture, uh, the construction started in March of 2020. Um, so we've been on campus for a good almost two years. And phase one, the front, what I like to refer to as the front lawn, uh, has been going quite well in respect to our separation that Matthew Jenga talked about, talked about uh, protection of staff, students, and the public. Um, we as Consigli uh, have a lot of experience, uh, many projects myself, um, the Thuin High School, Winchester High School that were occupied renovations. Uh, I'm on site full time uh, every day of the week. I have a staff of 10 people. So we are here uh, seven in the morning to like tonight, eight, eight o'clock. <laughs> um, but we're, we are here, we interact daily, sometimes not hourly, but Mr. McCarthy, Bill McCarthy is always there taking our calls and coordinating. Um, and I'd like to think what we've done to date um, has proven that we can harmoniously work and build a building and students can still productively learn. Um, what we do do, I'd like to get into some specifics just about um, what we have been doing and I'll just touch on it uh, for dust control, for example, uh, during the summer months or when gravel, we have a full-time water truck on site. And that also does the, actually the campus um, paved roads just to make sure that there's no dust there. Um, same thing with a street sweeper. We bring a street sweeper in once a week, but as needed if we're hauling out materials that may be tracking uh, onto the public streets of the campus. Um, and then when, when demolition occurs, we will be having uh, a full-time fire hoses uh, watering down dusting. Uh, for those of you that may have been familiar with the DPW project adjacent to us, that's what they did and that was a very successful, very little dust. All of that dust is monitored by a third party, um, McPhail Associates, who works for the design team. And again, we've already done that a couple, couple summers now. Um, so when we're moving dirt, they are monitoring air, uh, just to make sure the dust and the particles are, are, are contained. In respect to noise um, so, yeah, noise mitigation um, this may be something that maybe people don't even realize we're doing uh, we all hear backup alarms you go to the stop and shop you go to the whole foods you hear the trucks backing up you don't hear backup alarms on our project we have a white noise or a squelch backup alarm and that's because that's for every piece of equipment or lift that here on the site because we're adjacent to the building these are the type of things that we've learned over the years or know over the years are successful in trying to mitigate mitigate that noise, mitigate that, uh, the dust. Um, they're all about communication. We make sure that um, we're communicating with the school, as Matthew Jenga said and Bill McCarthy, in advance if we have large deliveries, large um, equipment gonna be coming to the site and we coordinate around um, testing, MCAST, uh, PSATs, SATs, we try to plan ahead accordingly in advance, not the day before, to make sure that we're trying to stay away from that end of the building. And if we can't, again, working with the school to make sure that accommodations are being made uh, to minimize that noise. There is a slide coming up, uh, two slides coming up. One, the last slide is an animation that we're gonna show you um, what we're gonna to do to take the building down and put the new building up for phase two. Uh, right now we've been in your front lawn, but now we're gonna be in your backyard. And we'll show you that in that animation in a moment. Um, so next slide, please. Matthew had mentioned the, um, or noted the traffic pattern. So right now in the back off of Millbrook or Mill Street, everybody comes in and drives around the circle or the rotary. Uh, we're still going to have that same ability, um, it's just going to be shifted uh, to what is the temporary parking lots that we've created on the softball field. Again, the uh, best approach is to use the main entrance number one, Mass Ave, because um, if you're coming by now, you can actually see that there's a nice drive lane there, no, there's no parking, students can be dropped off and come into the building. Um, there's also gonna be some new staff parking created in this phase just to make sure that the staff uh, has ample location to park. 
And the front lawn on this particular slide, because we're turning the phase one project over um, in February, we can't at this point do grass plantings or shrubbery. So in the spring, uh, as soon as Mother Nature, Mother Nature allows, we'll be doing the plantings and shrubbery, but you'll be able to still use the sidewalks and walkways uh, as is shown on that document, this document to get into the building. Um, next slide is the animation. Um, so this was put together to show what we would refer to as the heavy construction, the demolition and the structural steel and the, the superstructure as we refer to it as. Um, sorry, I'm just seeing if it looks like there might be an issue there. See if we can start that again. Okay, so this is gonna be a temporary connector building. It's got this flagged right there, that temporary connector is actually a heated covered walkway lit with fire alarm and fire protection. So the students will be able to go from the new building to the existing buildings. Um, you've seen in phase one covered walkways, we'll have the exact same uh, covered walkway approach to make sure it's overhead uh, and lit in a safe walkway to go from the Downs building to the courtyard. What you're seeing now is the superstructure or the existing buildings coming down. But as you can see, we're sandwiched in between the new phase one buildings, the Downs and the Fusco building. Um, the timeline is to drive the piles or do the foundation work in the summertime. As you can see in the, chart, uh, the graphic below there in August, you'll see the foundations going in. And then later in the season or towards September and October, structural steel being erected. Um, this is taken from an airplane view looking down to just to try to give everybody a nice overview of we're going to be, as I started in my, my presentation here, in your backyard. Um, and we'll do everything we can with all those mitigation measures we just mentioned uh, to work with the school, the staff, and the students, and obviously the community. At this point, I'd like to turn it back over to Dr. Jenger. So if you could just go back up two slides, I want to talk a little bit about the access to the building. I think it's two slides. Yep. So as John just talked about, we have two entrances to the building. One is on the Massachusetts Avenue side, and that's labeled as main entrance number one. Um, students will be able to do arrivals and dismissals at that location, um, but that's not the main office. That is the principal's office. So to the right of that entrance, be the principal's office and then if you look on the millbrook side of the um, school which is going to be a busier and more constricted area so if you're driving to the school we really recommend you use the mass Ave side um, but for pedestrian you can come in and loop around through the parking lots and then students can walk in that way as they have been through the uh through the park that goes alongside um, and then they would enter at main entrance too and there'll be a uh, two entrances there over time that'll shift, but there'll be signage. So at that location is what people have been calling the main office, and that's the attendance office. But you can check in and do arrivals and dismissals at either location. If someone sends you to the principal's office, it's gonna be off Mass Ave. If someone sends you to the main office or the attendance office, it's going to be off main entrance two on Millbrook. Um, so you can go back down again. All of this will be outlined in the FAQ and it will be in this the student quick guide as well. And we will go over it with students um, as we go into those phases. So um, in terms of pedestrian safety and access to the building, the Mass Ave, as we pointed out, is significantly less problematic in terms of crossing patterns. Um, we've done everything we can on the Millbrook side to route the student walkways through the park and then on, par on uh, sidewalks that go around, but as we know, students don't always follow those sidewalks. And so there is some crisscrossing of potential patterns, which is why we'd really rather people don't drive in the back if we can avoid it. Um, John has talked about the noise and air mitigation measures. There's a lot of work done on the construction side. 
in terms of timing things so that they're not disruptive of school and in terms of um, you know, dust mitigation with watering and monitoring and all those things. At the same time within the building, um, we've really focused on trying to make sure that the building functions and that they're able to have comfortable classrooms. And I wanna be realistic about this. Um, the current building has never been very comfortable. Some of the rooms get very hot, some of the rooms get very cold. Um, and we've been doing a lot of repairs uh, around ventilation and a lot of upgrades as part of COVID preparation, but also as part of preparation for this to make sure that all of the rooms have adequate ventilation and that in rooms that are not able to open their windows, so that would be on the east facing wall of Fusco, the north facing wall of Downs, and the south facing wall of the new building, um, that there is adequate ventilation and um, accommodation for comfort. On the east facing walls of Fusco, which is the old building, we've installed air conditioning, which required electrical upgrades throughout the side of the building. Um, in the new wing, you've got triple glazed glass and new HVAC, um, so the sound mitigation there should be pretty good. And then there's a, there are a small number of classrooms on the north wall of Downs House. Um, those have adequate ventilation. They will be more shaded actually than they have been in the past because of the new building. Um, and if necessary, um, we will do shifting of classrooms around, but we think that those should be adequate to navigate the construction project. Next slide. So as I mentioned before, we have been coordinating on a weekly basis. We will move to coordinating on a more daily basis. Um, we have already, and we'll go over again, the school calendar so that things like the MCAS or AP exams, we're able to take um, shifts so that we're not making noises right outside the window because those are times we really wanna make sure that there aren't interruptions. Um, one of the concerns we've had is around student mental health. Now, as we've said, we really hope that the new setup does not interfere with the process of class. However, we know that change is difficult. And right now we have a very stressed out student body, more so than usual, because of all of the disruptions and changes in the last couple of years. Um, so we are going to be alert to um, student mental health in terms of changes trying to do this in small pieces, trying to be understanding about expectations. You know, travel time is going to be an issue and we really wanna communicate. Just to be clear, I said I was gonna to get to that later. So we have on the calendar three minute passing time. In the current building, if you're coming from one far corner to the other building, that's not really a realistic time. The three minute time is there to emphasize that we expect students to go from one class directly to the next. We actually don't use bells in the school. Teachers dismiss the students in a timely fashion and the students arrive in a timely fashion. And the teachers are gonna understand that we're gonna to need to adjust to the travel times that are going to exist in the new building. Um, and so that's the understanding. If we change it to five minutes, that wouldn't solve the problem. What's gonna solve the problem is us being alert to the challenges and making sure that we're communicating. Specific groups of students in special education or other programs where we have concerns about their navigation of change, we're already working with those staff to plan and make sure that they are able to preview the changes and understand and address what's going on. In athletics, um, we have at this point already obtained and made plans and schedules for fields offsite where necessary, um, for gym facilities offsite, as in gymnastics when necessary. We are gonna lose use of the blue gym for athletics. So there will be a little bit more trading off of use of the red gym, but we've already worked that schedule through. And I do want to give a shout out to our custodians, um, as well as our coaches, who are really going to be flexible in terms of needing to transition the spaces more often. Um, and knowing that that's something that they're going to be doing, because, for example, the pit, which will continue to be used for wrestling, is also going to be used as a cafeteria site. So we know we can move the tables out and bring the uh, the mats in, but that is one more thing that the custodians are navigating. So I really want to appreciate them. And then in terms of special events, uh, the big events that people worry about, graduation, um, NHS induction, award ceremony, will be, be able to be housed in the school. 
NHS will be before we move out of the old auditorium. Award ceremony and graduation will have use of the new theater um, and um, the Pierce Field as we've done in the past. Um, and then other activities like the prom happen offsite. So we will still have the use of different facilities for other impromptu um, activities that students often plan in the spring. I believe that's the end of my slides. Next slide. So now I'm turning uh, the microphone over to Dr. Homan, who will lead us through the Q&A session. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Jenger. I want to um, actually, why don't we uh, take the slides down? Um, Amy, we can stop sharing so that we can see everyone. And I don't have any questions right now in the chat, so I'm going to go to some of the ones that were pre-submitted to us, but I want to remind families that if you have any questions about anything that we've presented, there is a chat uh, box in the bottom of the Lexikey um, platform, and you can leave us any questions and we'll be sure to answer those. So in some of the pre-submitted questions, we have several questions about the opportunity to tour the new buildings, excitement about these beautiful new spaces and questions about when they will be able to have a chance to see the inside of the buildings as parents of students at the school or members of the public. Before we address that, mm -hmm. I did wanna say if any alumni are on and they wanna to tour the old building, please reach out to my office. We will be running tours this weekend. Uh, we still have some openings for those who are interested. I guess the question is about when, when can parents see the building. I, you know, I think we're, the building committee will work with Dr. Jenger uh, to schedule some times. We do um, certainly for those members of the public who are members of town meeting, one of our goals is to get all town meeting members into the building prior to the start of town meeting in April. Um, and uh, I know Dr. We'll work with Dr. Jenger and his staff on something for parents. Thank you. Um, and then there's a question about uh, the demolition of parts of the old building and whether that will be happening during school hours. I know we spoke about uh, dust and noise control, um, but perhaps uh, John, you can speak a little bit more to sort of how the team is thinking through hours and what's going on during school hours a little bit more. Yes, the, the demolition will be occurring during the school year. Um, the way it's aligned with the schedule starting in uh, late March, probably mid-March, the demolition will commence. Uh, we recognize that we have students uh, adjacent as well as as an apartment building off um, on Millbrook. So there is no easy way of doing a staggered start at midday and demolition and then go into the, the night because then you have got the flip side of the neighborhood. Um, so it will be a 7 a.m. start um, and we are looking at extended days, um, but it's a very large building. So we have a time frame of approximately six weeks uh, to take the demolition down or take the buildings down. Obviously not all at once as the animation show. Uh, there is a question about when the bike path will be accessible to uh, the high school, from the bike path to the high school. Yeah, um, I'm going to take it. <laughs> I, I can speak to that. It's, uh, okay. it, it's phase four. Yeah. Uh, and phase four is for May of 2025 or right around that time frame is when that would be open to the public. Um, and John, maybe we can stay on a bit of this question because there was also a question about how many phases there are as part of the project, which you just sort of answered, but maybe you can talk through each of the subsequent phases. Sure, so phase two, we just spent a lot of time on today. Um, that finishes roughly um, September of 2020. I always get my numbers, my years mixed up here, 23. Um, and then phase three is taking down the Fusco and the Blue Gym and putting up a, um, a, a, a athletic facility, a large uh, athletic facility gym and locker rooms supporting it. Phase four is then taking down the downs and the red gym and creating those synthetic turf fields. The way that schedule falls is the synthetic turf fields cannot be put down in the wintertime 
So the buildings will be torn down, the fields will be prepped, and that's why we're gonna go into the May, uh, April, May of 2025 to put the synthetic turf fields down. So four phases. Phase one is nearing completion. Um, there's a question about how traffic on Mass Ave will be managed during the drop-off period in the morning. I think maybe um, Matthew or Bill would be best to answer this one. I mean, so uh, we as a as an educational staff will not be traffic <laughs> officers. Um, so our expectation is that people will follow traffic laws. There is an extra lane. So if you pull over to that extra lane, it's just as if you were in what used to be parking. So you should be pulling out of traffic there um, and then unloading. I think if, um, if after we open up, we find that there are difficulties with people obeying traffic laws, we will probably reach out to our school resource officer and to the Arlington Police Department to help us direct traffic in order to train folks. But I'm assuming that folks will come in a timely fashion and figure out the pathways. Um, one of the challenges we talked about when we designed the project in the beginning was that traffic during that brief window of rush minute in Arlington is challenging in that area. It might take you an extra five minutes to sort of pass through that area of the town. We handle traffic better than in the past, but we are not able to handle traffic perfectly. So I think people will have to be patient and plan accordingly that there will most likely be some slowdown on mill. And then as you come along Mass Ave. Um, there are questions about the time it's going to take the kids to walk from, for example, the CBS end of the steam wing to the farthest end of downs and questions about um, class passing time and sort of mitigating the challenges for the students of getting all the way around the building. So as I, as I tried to explain before, and I we talk about in the FAQ, right now we have a mile and a half of hallway. Um, we have 25 stairwells. And so our three minute passing time is there with the understanding that not all students can get from one class to the other in three minutes. Our ex we don't use bells as I explained. So it's not like you've got a eh, and then it's a race and then another bell goes off. Teachers um, release their students when the clock says that it's time to release their students. Um, and then teachers start their classes when all of the students are there. The expectation for students is that they go directly from one class to the next. Um, and so, you know, most of your class, if you're in Downs House, will be able to get there in around three or four minutes. If you've got one kid that's coming all the way from the chemistry wing, um, we're not sure how long it will take and we'll learn over time. But the teacher is going to know that that student's coming from the chemistry wing. And if they're there within seven minutes, um, the rest of the class is able to adjust. We have talked in the past about lengthening those passing times, but the reality was the lengthening of the passing times led students to linger in the halls, which meant the passing was slower and harder for students. Um, and so we really just wanna emphasize, you go from one class to the next um, directly, and then we start class when everybody gets there. So we, we will, and I think this is important because it's actually funny, there's apparently a thread online of students complaining about other students walking slow in the hall, making them late to class, which is a wonderful thing about our students. Um, but we know that, that some students aren't clear on those expectations. And so we will make sure to re-emphasize those multiple times so students know that they should move quickly, but without stress from one class to the other. All right, there are questions about um, biking, a couple of different questions about biking. And um, it may be that some of these are ones that we may need to take back to the town and consider uh, with members of our, our town um, administrators, but there's a question about what, what's being done to make sure that it's safe for students to bike on Mass Ave, because that's where the car drop-off zone will be. We have students who commute to the um, a different side of town along Mass Ave, and also where bike parking will be on Mass Ave or on Mill Street. So again, bike travel is not going to change on Mass Ave as a result of the new building. Um, bike parking will be better in front of the building because there's a large number of bike um, as, as part of the design, which is a Leeds, we believe gold, maybe even platinum um, building design. There are a lot, is a lot of bike parking going into the new construction. And we're gonna take the bike racks that we have in the front of the building um, and move those to the back. So we should have a fair number of bike 
uh, racks in the back of the building so that students can lock up their bike. If you're coming in from the um, Millbrook side, um, there is actually a bike ramp that comes down by Shaddix by the Ace Hardware there. Um, and then students can come in on the driveway and come around in the park um, and then use the, to, the sidewalk that gets you to the school. There's a question about air quality and reporting. Will you regularly report on air quality and ventilation, especially in the rooms where kids are eating and are unmasked? Um, I will start with this question and then I may turn it over to um, John, but we, in all of our rooms in the current building and all of our rooms in the new building, um, any rooms where students are eating and are unmasked, we have extra air purifiers in those rooms. We have tested ventilation repeatedly in those rooms. And whenever we have concerns about the ventilation, we retest to make sure air exchange rates are turning the air over it at an interval of 50, every 15 minutes, if not more often. So in terms of COVID safety, we've done those ventilation air exchange checks, and that's what's really important um, for eating and unmasked when it comes to the pandemic. Uh, but in, in terms of the actual building project and air quality and ventilation, I'll have to turn it over to one of our building uh, construction folks. Um, I did ne neglect to talk about that in the uh, air, my section about air. So. Um, we have a baseline established uh, once a month. We have a third party independent uh, industrial hygienist that comes in and walks the actual existing building. And we'll do the same thing in the new construction building once we turn it over, um, verifying the air quality. Um, so when the students in the building, we do a baseline um, and then we take that baseline and make sure that the air, the particles in the air aren't elevated due to the construction. Uh, and to date, again, like I touched on before, we've been doing this now for over a year and a half and all of the readings have been coming in fine. And if there should be an unknown or a smell, they are on call um, to come to the project uh, and do an investigation to see if there's a, sometimes it's as simple as that there could be a mopping solvent, um, you know, that was more robust than it should be. But to date, we haven't had that. And that's all uh, documented monthly and that report is provided uh, to Skanska and then to the town. Um, we also have a note that the monthly air quality reports are posted on the project website if anybody ever wants to go look those up. And I have two questions for Lori, I think. Uh, what, so first one is, what LEED certification does AHS meet? Dr. Jenger just referred to this and somebody's curious what the LEED certification is. And then the second one was whether or not the, there would be bricks you, being used to face the phase two building, similar to the phase one. So yes, we are absolutely LEED gold and we are, quite close to lead platinum. And so we are making that push as a whole project team to achieve that. So uh, fingers crossed that we can get all those points. Um, and then uh, the, whole, the whole building is masonry and um, it's a combination of uh, brick size and um, larger size, which are referred to as CMU. And all sides, the, you know, the rest of the building have both, both of those materials. Um, is there any plan to consider the ease of academic workload, homework, et cetera, to accommodate the transition into the new building and during demolition? Dr. Jenger. So that's always a challenge. I mean, we are and have been really working very hard on pacing of work around reasonable expectations for students. Um, and so we will continue to do so if we find that there is, we're, we're always telling teachers to, to sort of think about rigor, but at the same time, to be really aware that if you push, you don't get anywhere if you're you know just dumping things on people. So to keep the pace of work appropriate to the environment of the school and the capacity of the students to manage it. Um, and so we will we will adjust as necessary. Um, and you know we're also we are also going to have to there will be times as we're leading up where teachers may need some release time. Um, in order to get stuff ready. And we'll do that in a rolling fashion so it doesn't shut down anything. Um, and we'll, we'll take a, you know, adjustments as we can go. So I, I would say yes, um, as a practice that we've really been working on a lot this year. 
Um, and then during heavy demolition days, can students who have respiratory issues be allowed to miss school or join remotely? Um, I will say that remote instruction is not a model that we're permitted to use uh, per the state. So the op opportunity for us to officially give students an in-school day or an attendance counted day while they're learning remotely is not something that we are able to accommodate. Um, Dr. Jenger, do you wanna speak to what families should do if they're concerned about respiratory issues? Um, sure. I mean, if you have a diagnosed respiratory issue, you should absolutely contact the nurse and give them information from your medical provider so that they can be aware of ways that we can support your student. My hope would be, and this is the conversation we've had with Consigli, that the air quality in the school is not degraded. Um, and so unless we are you know, having an unfortunate situation that we don't foresee, the, a student with respiratory issues should not be impacted um, by the project. But if there is a student with a respiratory issue that we need to be alert to in case something untoward happens, please notify the nurse so we know about that student in advance. Will there be air conditioning in the classrooms? Maybe um, Dr. Jenger and Mr. McCarthy can speak to where that we have air conditioning in the building. So currently we have very limited air conditioning in the building. We did put air conditioning in the classrooms that will face the um, direct demolition. And that was done intentionally to mitigate sound and uh, to act as filtration as well. We do have some um, air conditioners that were also placed um, in the building, the Fosco House building facing the new construction uh, for a similar reason uh, as the construction went up on the new building. So those are the two areas that have air conditioning in the classroom areas. Uh, right now, the Downs House offices and classrooms, uh, we did a full review of those back when um, COVID first came out, uh, and the ventilation process in there uh, has been deemed as uh, acceptable. Uh, we went through, assessed the systems, and made any repairs to the older system to make sure it was fully working. So we don't have concerns about ventilation in those spaces at this time. And did you say, uh, Mr. McCarthy, that the new a reminder that the new wings will have air conditioning? Oh yeah, sorry, I kind of so, just ran with that. Uh, yeah, the new building will have um, air ventilation as well. So, in, in, and I just want to point out that in addition to having conditioned cooled air in the new building, there's also um, fil a HEPA filtration throughout the HVAC system. And correct me if I'm wrong, Lori, but there's also UV. Um, sort of for virus killing um, in the ventilation system? Um, we, we did, the building committee did add to the system. Uh, it was voted on. Um, fortunately, we were able to do that before we finished the construction documents to make sure that we were able to provide um, a more robust um, system for the building than, than was originally planned for. So. Um, and I have at the moment have one more question. So if families have any additional questions, drop them in the chat while we answer this one. There's a question about um, what, when, and for what will the amphitheater be used? So the, the amp go ahead, Bill. Okay. Um, the amphitheater will not be completed until phase three mm -hmm. as the gym facilities are completed because that's the secondary wall of the amphitheater. Our goal is to use the amphitheater as an outdoor classroom, uh, also to house theater productions, music productions, uh, outdoor events, and things of that nature. So it'll be tied into our curriculum during the day and as an event space in the evenings. Um, and just one thing to point out that the amphitheater um, back faces down to the black box theater. So behind the stage there is our black box theater. So our theater program or drama program can then use the outdoor stage there um, with support right out the back. So we'll expect that we'll have outdoor performances there as well. All right. I don't have any more questions. I do have a thank you for all the great work and for this update. Um, I am back putting on my, who just put on his pajama. There you go. <laughs> We're on the mic for that. <laughs> Um, I think, yeah, that's right. Okay, so you wanted to put up this last slide. Um, 
So please make sure that you join us on January 25th as we look forward to that forum. We're going to be really focusing in on uh, details about the move itself so the families can get any questions answered about what that process is going to look like. Um, there are construction updates and e-bulletins available for you to sign up for. You can go to the project website for that. Uh, follow the project on Facebook or email us with any questions or concerns that you have. And Mr. Thielman, is there anything else you would like to add before we sign off? No, we just thank everybody in town for tuning in tonight. And uh, please, you know, email, if you have any questions, you can shoot us an email at that address and we'll get back to you as quickly as we can. So thanks so much for your support of this project. Uh, this is a townwide effort and uh, I think it's gonna be, a, it's a point of pride for the entire community. So thank you so much. Have a good evening. We have several thank yous in the chat. Um, thank you for joining us. Have a good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. <laughs>